Unlike fanny packs, ball cuts, and troll dolls, the sensation is back, only at Zaxby's. The sensation salad and the new sensation filet sandwich features hand-breaded chicken, Asian slaw, wonton strips, and citrus vinaigrette, and both are served with an egg roll. The sensation salad and the new sensation filet sandwich meal for a limited time, only at Zaxby's. And skip the line when you order ahead on the Zaxby's app or on Zaxby's.com. From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. To wake up, wake up, wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Zaxby's. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hunchavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! What's up, everybody? Welcome into Wake Up Warchant, presented by Zaxby's. I'm Aslan, joined by Corey Clark via the telephone as he scooters and putters his way down to Tallahassee from the greater Atlanta area. Folks, uh, we're part of the Warchant.com family. Use the promo code WARCHANT30. If you're not already a member, that'll get you 30 free days of access to the ultimate Seminole Sports Source. Also, I promise tomorrow, it's Tuesday. It sounds cool. Telephone Tuesday. We will take phone calls. Sevi, you're in Nashville. You always leave phone, funny phone calls. I'll take it. I promise. 850-792-5730. Uh, tell us what you really think, people, what you really think. Corey and I will tell you what we really think here coming up. But um, first off, Corey, just tell us how you're doing right now. Uh, you know, doing all right. Just uh, spent, uh, I guess I would say, nine hours in a baseball field. Ten hours, maybe. Nine hours. Uh, watching my son's team lose in a championship game. Uh, so that was fun. But now I'm on the road. Now I'm on the road back to Tallahassee. Should be in around three in the morning. Oh, gosh. Wake up, man. And Wait. to top it all off, he uh, struck out with the bases loaded in the game. No, why would so I why? feel like I should have I should have left maybe before that. Like I wait you know, I, I waited an extra four hours to to watch that. Brady, you uh you miss a hundred of the RBIs that you don't swing at. So keep going, Chan. He went down swinging. At least he went down swinging. Yes. I was happy with that. But he did in fact go down. All right. Uh, we're presented to you by Zaxby's. I started off my Saturday by signing up to YouTube Live so I could watch the Knowles, and I went by Zaxby's and grabbed the Nibbler's Meal. The Nibbler's Meal is uh, three chicken fingers uh, on a nice toasted bun. Three toasted buns, three chicken fingers, uh, and then a nice uh, side of, uh, of, of their seasoned fries. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, the game, maybe not so much. I don't know. I'm in such a weird place, Corey. Uh, there's so much to talk about with this game. Uh, a lot of angry people, like in terms of like my family and friends, I'm not as upset. Uh, I guess let's start at the end and then maybe work our way into other parts of the game. That final play, um, you know, with, with Keyshawn catching the ball at the four-yard line, it seemed like there were seven or six seconds left in the ball game. And for whatever reason, by the time they get lined up, there's only one. They decide to go ahead and, and do a direct snap with, I, I don't know, like was that was that some sort of poetic homage to Warwick Dunn? Do like do do we realize what we were doing there? Was this gonna was that gonna exercise the demons? What was your thoughts? I guess just as that whole thing uh, developed. Yeah, it was all just bizarre and surreal. I mean, I, it seems like more than a coincidence that they called that play. Um, in that stadium against, you know, obviously against that team, um, in, in a spot like that, um, it was almost like they wanted to make they were paying homage, or they wanted to make amends for the work done play. But the work done play was called in a, uh, you know, much uh, a, a much more normal pos- position. I mean, it was a coming out of a, either a timeout or an incomplete pass, and it wasn't a helter skelter and just a a crazy fire drill. The whole thing was out of whack. I know the clock didn't stop when it should have. It ran a couple of seconds off. But I also don't think that anybody was looking at the clock saying, oh, no, we can't spike it. we got to snap it. Like, there was no intent ever to spike the ball. And there should have been. And that's not hindsight. Because I think with a play like that, the the whole play to me is it's supposed to be – it's almost – well, it is a trick play. It's to confuse the defense. Well, the defense wasn't even set enough to be confused. You know, like if you come out of a if you come out of a spike, and they've had thirty seconds to see it, it would make more sense than trying a gimmick play like that when you're snapping it with one second left on the clock. And what makes it worse um, is that you know Ryan Roberts backs up in pass protection. Um, the guard, I don't know which guard it was, pulls and hits him. Brady Scott and runs into him. 
Brady Scott runs into him. Uh, Tamori and Terry, I don't even know if he knew they were going to snap the ball. He just stood there when I assume he's supposed to be blocking on that play. It's just, obviously, it's hindsight. But if they practice that or not, it didn't look like they practiced that situation at all. Like, hey, hey, in this spot, if we get down under the five, in the five uh, inside the five with four seconds left, we're going to do the direct snap to Cam. It didn't look like the team had practiced that at all. And, um, you know, are they going to win anyway? I don't know. Even if they, even if they uh, spike it and then call that play after the spike or they call something else, it, there's no guarantee they're going to win, even if they go to overtime. But it's just you didn't give yourself the best chance to win because you ran a, uh, a play where half your team didn't look like they knew what the play was. And even if they did, it was snuffed out completely by a defense that wasn't even fully set. Yeah, my first instinct was clock it, clock it, you know, spike the ball, have 30 seconds to think it over, and then and then run a play. But this does, obviously, it, it fits the brand. It fits the, the mindset, this whole tempo thing. You know, people want the offense to slow down to help out the defense. It's just not going to happen. It's You can't – I don't think you can drill this. I don't think you can run this offense – wishy-washy in the middle that you really do have to be sort of sold out and dedicated to always going fast the problem though there is is just what happens to the communication there um you know and there was a question asked to Willie kind of was was that play already sort of called that if you you know when because did they come out of timeout on that third down did like did 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 James get sacked on the second down and then the third down he throws it to Keyshawn I can't remember I should probably pull that up as I speak about this yeah, uh, you, I don't remember. I, I'm not sure about that either. Um, I'm pulling it up right now. He got sacked, passes incomplete on uh, second down, and then the third down completion to Keyshawn. So they, they weren't coming out of a stoppage. So I guess that makes that, that question maybe a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say inappropriate, but it, we'll talk about that that question, that exchange with Willie Taggart later in the show. But the, the fact of the matter was basically, you know, you convert the, the third down, you're inside the five-yard line, time is winding down, it fits your culture, your mindset to go ahead and try to get something off. But I just, I, I, the fact that you don't know, no one, the 11 guys out there, I don't know, maybe four guys knew, you know, I and mean, I guess the, the important one was for Cam to know, and he gets the snap, and Bavion knows to snap it to him. I guess that's the crazy thing, too, right? Bavion knows to snap it to Cam, but Ryan Roberts doesn't know that that's happening. <clears throat> Same thing with Tamori and Terry, obviously, because he's not even blocking the guy on the outside. So um, I, I guess this is sort of a vol for me. It went from bad clock management to, uh, I guess, just poor communication, which is, I don't know, that's, that's almost maybe more of a bummer looking back on it. Yeah, it, it it just again I don't I don't know that you're giving your best your team the best chance to win in that instance without clocking it. Um, uh, and I know it's hindsight. Uh, just that play in particular. Um, I mean, I would have even been better with a more of a just a straight handoff. But you know, he obviously the play is to run right. Well, what if the defense not being set? You, what if they're what if for whatever reason they're they're aligned to the right? They have more guys over there than you can block. You don't even have a time. You don't have time to look at the defense and say, "Okay, let's switch it to this side" or whatever you need to do. Hmm. Like it's just okay. We're snapping it, and you're running it right, no matter what the defense does, no matter what the defense is telling is it, uh, telling us it's going to do, because we didn't spike the ball, so we have no. James has no time to look at the defense at all, none. Um, and in that instance, I think with the play coming down to the final play, uh, I think I think you clock it. I, I don't think. I don't think you were doing yourself any favors. I don't think you were getting a, a, a decided advantage schematically by snapping it at the tempo right there where they, don't, where they didn't have time to get set because you ran into – it looked like four people. It looked like four people were out there waiting on him. He makes a great run to almost score mm -hmm. by himself. Literally, if you call a play, if you call any play in that sport and your running back has to break four tackles by himself out wide, because your wide receiver's not blocking and your right tackle didn't move at all, it's a bad play call. And I don't know, I don't know, maybe Ryan Roberts was the only one that didn't know. And maybe Tamori and Terry just didn't feel like blocking. I don't know. You're right. Maybe on knew. And Eddie Scott knew because he was pulling. And James Blackman knew and Cam knew. So maybe most of the team didn't know that that was the play. Maybe they practiced that a lot, but it didn't look like it. And I just think in that instance, you clock it and you give yourself a time to relax and breathe and, and uh, make sure it's the right play call. 
Right. You want to talk about a team that's learning to win and doing things that Willie says is, is losing football. It's not being able to probably communicate in a play, but I guess Willie sort of, you know, touched on some of that frustration and some of his post-game comments. Well, again, we'll maybe we'll get to that later. Well, let's see on the offensive side of the ball, Corey, James Blackman's performance. Uh, he was uh, 22 of 37, 234 yards, three touchdowns. He did not turn the ball over, I don't think, either. So uh, that's always an encouraging thing as well. But uh, by and large, I feel like there's a – this fan base is, I don't know, I don't know who to judge the fan base based on. Is it Warchan? Is it Twitter? Is it my friends and family? Uh, not a lot of people happy about the way that James Blackman performed on Saturday night in Charlottesville. I'm not one of them. I He could have done better. He had Tamori and Terry wide open, uh, potential game-tying touchdown. Uh, that was a bummer. You know, I think uh, the series before that, he misses Trey McKitty. Uh, on a third down conversion. Also, I think I saw a replay of it, and somebody was running absolutely wide. I mean, you want to talk about Tamori and Terry being wide open on that final drive. Uh, on the sequence before, the possession before, when that third down pass falls incomplete to Trey, I mean, somebody, I think it was on Terry Wilson, just absolutely just streaks down the left sideline, totally wide open, and he doesn't make that read. Uh, nothing's going to be perfect. He's the best of the bunch, I think, but, uh, you know, I keep seeing this. He's not FSU caliber. I don't know, like, what is FSU caliber? I mean, is it is it Jameis and, and Charlie and, and maybe Casey and then that's it? Or, you know, I, I just I, – it's frustrating to kind of see him keep taking a beating on the field and off the field as well. I I thought he played well enough for the team to win, but they didn't. Oh, yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I think the, obviously the, the, the throw we have to have back is the Terry one on the final drive. I mean, you, you can't miss that throw by that much. You just yeah. can't. Um, it's an out and up. Like it's not like they're running stride for stride, and you have to put it out there to see if he can break, you know, break away and, and run up under it. He is eight yards open. You can't. You have to put some air under it and not try to throw a lot. You don't have to put some arc on it, man. Uh, he threw it as if, uh, yeah, the, the kid was running stride for stride with Terry. It was a uh, uh, just a terrible throw in an awful spot. But yeah, you, you know, I, overall, I thought he played. I thought he played pretty well. He certainly wasn't the reason they lost the game. He made some big-time throws yeah. um, when they absolutely had to have it and some big-time reads. Um, he was not good on the final two possessions. Um, nobody could say that he was, uh, although that was a nice throw to Keyshawn. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he wasn't, you know, he was, He certainly wasn't the reason they lost the game. He, he avoided some pressure and made some nice plays on the run. I think he only got sacked until that final drive. I think he'd only been sacked once or twice maybe. Yeah, um, twice overall. So I, 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 I <laughs> You know, I, I thought he did. I thought he did pretty darn well for the most part. He's not. No, he's not a great quarterback. But what is FSU caliber? Yeah, what does that even mean? I don't know. That that's the thing. I I don't understand. If you don't win a Heisman here, are you are you not are you not worthy of wearing this helmet and, and that jersey and playing that position? It just it feels really uh, impractical and unreasonable to have that kind of expectation, especially for a kid who's now you know I know it's his third year on campus, but it's his third different offensive coordinator. Uh, you know on the road, hostile crowd, ranked opponent, uh, all the things that are swirling around this program right now. Uh, he, he, he gave everything he had, and obviously he's got to make that throw. I get it. Like, he has to make that throw to Tamori and Terry, but, uh, I mean, there's just so much blame to kind of continue to go well, around. Well, the other it's... one, too, right? Uh, the possession before on the third down, didn't he throw behind? Uh, yeah, Trey. Was it McKitty? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, yeah, I think initially I thought he was, uh, he was gesturing like, man, why did he – it was McKitty's fault when he was looking at the sidelines. And then he patted his yeah. chest like it, had, it actually was his fault. Yep. Yeah, man, you got to make that. You, you have to make those two throws. You have to. Those are what those are what winning quarterbacks do is they make those throws when they're open. And both of those were wide open, and he just made bad throws. But the game was a lot more than uh, two passes. And uh, you know the offense was fine. It wasn't great. I mean, they went on the road and scored twenty four points and had whatever they had three hundred and fifty yards of offense. I mean, the offense. Um, you know, was was decent, was pretty good. Um, I don't know that – what I think the bigger problem with this season is, is they have to figure out a way to give their defense a break in the fourth quarter. They just have to. I mean, that's three games in a row now where the defense might as well not be out on the field. They, they, they just might not as well – I mean, that's th have they gotten any stops in the fourth quarter the, 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 this season? Not. I mean, I'm sure they have. I just don't remember them. Yeah. But Boise State went up and down the field in the fourth quarter. Louisa Monroe tied the game in the fourth quarter, and they were lucky they didn't try to go for the win. 
and then Virginia was three for three with touchdowns in the fourth quarter. That's not a coincidence. You don't have any depth up front, and you run this breakneck offensive pace where the defense is on the field for 40 minutes a game. And I know Kendall Bryles can say, look, it's not my job to worry about the defense, and that's true. His job, I guess as it's described to him, is let's get as many points as we can. We're going to need as many points as we can, do whatever it takes. But you know what? When Marvin Wilson, your best, I mean, I don't even know how many snaps Marvin Wilson played. 70, 65, 80, did he play 90% of the snaps? That's a ton for a 320-pound defensive tackle. And by the end of the game, uh, Janarius Robinson, Janaris, 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 uh, Janaris. Marvin, wow. Marvin played, number uh, 11. Marvin played 58 snaps. He was the highest graded defensive player at 90.6. He graded out. James Blackman was the uh, top graded out offensive player according to Pro Football Focus. Do you know how many snaps there were total? Uh, well, it looks like here that uh, I how see many, that how Lars. How many did like Dean play? Well, Lars Woodby had 75. That's the highest of anybody. 79. It looks so like Marvin, there were 79. There were 79. So Nar- Marvin played 58 to 79? Yeah. So that's what is that's seventy five percent of the game. That's a lot for a defensive tackle, and and I know Kendo went down, um, so Robinson had to play a ton too. But you, if you watch him on that two point conversion at the end of the game, he's done. He's done. He's exhausted. And at some point, I know that Kendall Browse has paid a million dollars to score points and move the ball, but at some point, you have to think about your defense a little bit. Number one, it's not very good at all, and it's. It might as well be a peewee team when it's tired. When the front four is tired and exhausted, it might as well be a peewee team because they are not stopping anyone. They just don't do it. And that's three weeks in a row it's happened. So it's not a coincidence. At some point, you would think, and it's, it's the head coach's responsibility, um, you have to slow it down a little bit. And I don't, I don't necessarily have a problem with, um, you know, I had a bunch of people text me or tweet at me about that second-to-last possession where they had a one point lead and they went a three they went three and out, I think, in like nine seconds. Right. But okay, so they so maybe they take some time and milk the clock. All right, well then they go three and out in a minute two. Virginia was still gonna score. But that didn't that wasn't changing anything. It's during the course of the actual game. There can be times where you slow it down a little bit as the game's being played out, in my opinion. And normal and, and I just think my my initial thought of this season and how it might play out if Kendall Bryles is used to Baylor, where, okay, we're going to give up 41 points. That's okay, but we're going to score 52. Well, uh, Florida State's offense isn't that good. They don't have it down that well yet. They're not an offense that's going to put up 50-something points. They're going to put up 30 points. Well, 30 points with this defense, if it's exhausted, is going to get you beat most times. So there's got to be some. There's got to be a little wiggle room, right, yeah. where you're not snapping it, every, where you're not getting killed uh, two to one in time of possession. That defense is not good enough, and it does not have enough to, enough depth to be on the field more than any other defense in the country. And right now, that's what you're looking at, right? Aren't they 130th in, out of 130 in time of possession? I don't know. You're killing me with all the stuff you want me to look up, man. I just looked up. Uh... Sorry, sorry. I'm, I, I thought I saw a tweet where they're 130th out of 130 in time of possession. So uh... if you want to know why the defense collapses in the fourth quarter. That is why. And the offense isn't quite good enough right now to keep pace with a collapsing defense. So you got to figure out a way to make that marriage work a little bit. But, I, you know, the defense, I thought, it was something to be proud of for the first three quarters. They played their rear ends off, didn't you think? Yeah. I mean, I had they, they definitely played better, um, you know, fourth quarter notwithstanding. And, um you know, I, they, I know they drop into a soft zone for most of that oh, second half, and soft is it, soft doesn't even do it justice. And it sounds it's like, like a Pils, yeah. it's like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Yeah, um, I you know I don't. I mean, I'm assuming you you the guys that you can trust maybe aren't at, or still aren't operating at 100 percent that late in a game. I don't know if that's a conditioning problem. I mean, I, I don't know what that's the only thing I can really think of as to why you're sort of dialing down your aggression and the aggressiveness that you're playing with, or maybe it's the fact that, to your point, some three and outs and you keep throwing the defense back out there. But I just felt like with the soft zone stuff, it was, you know, make Virginia have to win this game, like make this kid play quarterback. I don't know. I I had a feeling that eventually one of these passes was going to get tipped. One of them was going to, you know, 
either was going to get tipped to the line of scrimmage or maybe the Virginia guy, you know, hits off his hands or maybe one of the guys is able to break on the ball good enough. And then it just felt like that it, it wasn't sustainable for Virginia to continue to keep making the plays and completing pass after pass after pass. And to some folks, that might sound like a loser mentality where you're, you're sitting back on your heels and you're waiting for the other team to make a mistake. But that's the way I feel they were, they were uh, approaching it. And I really didn't have that big of a problem with it. Um, I mean, credit to Virginia. I, I know that sounds lame, but the touchdown they scored, I think, in the fourth quarter to start it off, like that was just a really well-designed play. I mean, Tim Hasselbeck broke it down in terms of the way they, they went in motion. That let Perkins know that they were in, his, in zone coverage. And then they ran, a, they ran a post on the inside, and then they wheeled the guy out. The Joe Reed, they, they put him on a wheel route. They, they isolated him with Leonard Warner, and Leonard Warner's not going to be able to keep up with a guy that's a wide receiver. I mean, it's just not his, his game as a linebacker to, to be able to, to go stride for, sky, stride for stride with a guy that has that sort of skill set. So, I mean, a lot of the things that Virginia pulled off, that big run they had, they only had that one big run in the entire game that was like over 20 yards. I think it was the same guy as that Joe Reed guy as a wide receiver. It's just, I mean, it was blocked up perfectly. They, 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 the flow went to the right. They cut back to the left. Like, everything was so well designed and executed. And I don't want to go all Mike Martin here, but, like, you sometimes have to really do tip your cap to the other team. Otherwise, for three quarters, Virginia really couldn't do anything. So, again, ultimately, I know Florida State lost, but to me, the way the defense played, that was, it was quite encouraging. And I, did, and I didn't have a problem with the zone. I really didn't, but... Um, I would like for you to be more aggressive, but I, I, I would like to think that since it worked for three quarters, there's a reason why they went away from it because I don't know if they felt they couldn't get to the quarterback and uh, if they would have kept trying to blitz and, and fail to get to him, it would make things easier for Virginia. But again, ultimately they lost. So I, I trying to defend these things it sounds like a fool's errand sometimes. Well, look, at the end of the day, man, what we're looking at is a, is a, is a pretty bad to awful defense, no matter whether they play man or zone. It just doesn't really matter. They're not going to be very good. It's just not going to happen. But what I liked for the first two and a half to three quarters is they were physical. They yeah. owned the line of scrimmage. They did. They had a really good pass rush. Marvin was incredible. And I don't even know if he – I don't know how many tackles he had, too. But Marvin Wilson, they could not block. He had that kid running for his life. And now he's a 320-pound kid trying to tackle Bryce Perkins. That's not going to happen. But he moved him out of the pocket a lot. Cooper was good. Kando had a, a couple of really nice rushes until he got hurt. And, uh, and Robinson was okay. I'm not even trying to pronounce his first name. I'm tired of mispronouncing it. So, Janaris. 11, Robinson. Janaris. Um, no, I, I'm not going to remember it. <laughs> so, um, I'm not going to even try. No offense, uh, Robinson. I just I have a middle block, and I can't remember it. Marvin so, had um, two tackles, by the way. Marvin had two tackles. Isn't that crazy? He was awesome. Yeah. He was really good. Uh, not, the, the punch in the end zone notwithstanding. He was, right. he was really good. They own the line of scrimmage for the most part, and they hit really hard even in the zone. When, when they were completing pass in the first half, I thought they were paying the price. I really did. I thought they brought it. They were hitting hard. They were hitting like a Florida State defense. My problem, though, is, you know, at, at the end of that game, literally, I mean, none of it was working. It was inevitable that they were going to score. It's not like they were – Did he? can you remember a throw? And he completed 30 of them. That he threw into a tight window? No, no. One, like all they were doing was the, the tight end would run eight yards and stop, or the wide receiver would run six yards and stop, or the running back would run on the flat and nobody would be there. It was simple. It wasn't like they were well-designed plays. The zone was ridiculous. And when you're getting carved up like that, and this kid is not Aaron Rodgers. He's a nice quarterback, but he's not a great thrower of the football. But he is when, you know, Brady could have completed 30 or 40 against that defense. Uh, well, you know, maybe not. I don't know if he had the arm to get the the one over uh, Warner. It'd have been close. Tom Brady but, or Brady um, Clark? Brady Clark. Sorry, okay. Tom Brady would have gone forty for forty. Okay. But um, but but maybe maybe somebody drops it. That kid dropped it. I loved when the Virginia dro- receiver dropped the pass, and it was their only second incompletion of the second half. And of course, Sanford Samuels has to talk to him about it. <laughs> it's like, dude, how about you go up and make a play, or actually break up a pass before you talk you talk noise to a, a bit of Virginia wide receiver? Uh, why don't you play man to man? Why don't you get up on them? Anyway, um, that's another story that we'll get to here in, a, here in a bit. But I just don't understand what they were trying to accomplish with the zone in the fourth quarter. It, other, it was just death by a thousand paper cuts as opposed to, I guess, we don't want them to go over. The, I guess they were thinking what you thought, is that eventually if we play zone long enough, this kid's going to make a poor read 
and he's going to make a bad throw or we're going to tip it and we're going to get a big play. But the problem is the, the, the receivers were so open that he couldn't make a bad read, and they were open so quickly that whatever they were trying to accomplish in that zone, and I know it's hard when you have those linebackers, it was it was pointless. So I, I just don't – at some point you gotta you got to just say, man, if they beat us over the top, then they beat us over the top. And the, 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 play, the thing about the Leonard Warner play that I don't understand, and I, maybe we can ask Barnett about it, um, Asante Samuel has the receiver out wide right there. And that receiver runs a post into the middle of the field to clear Asante Samuel. Meanwhile, Florida State, I assume it's Fagan, already has a safety in the middle of the field. That receiver is running right towards the safety in the middle of the field. So that receiver that Asante Samuel is covering is covered. He's not throwing it there. So wouldn't Asante Samuel maybe, is there a chance you can take a peek and say, oh, no, 35 can't cover that guy. That's probably where they're going. And, like, stay home? I know that's not his job necessarily, but you'd like that to be an option. Like, oh, hey, when you see your 245-pound linebacker matched up with their fastest wide receiver, keep an eye on that. Like, just have a little bit – and he's a, I think he's a good football player. Um, I think he's their best cornerback. Um, but maybe a little more uh, – I don't want to say football IQ because that makes it sound like he's dumb. I think he's a smart football player. Just in that moment, have a little more wherewithal to understand the situation and maybe see that play coming. And I know that's a lot to ask, but that's what that's what great defenses or even good defenses do. Our great players do. They they see something like that. They read it. They diagnose it. And now he was covering his guy, but they just basically he was basically covering a guy running straight to a safety. Me thought that he left on that side of the field. The only person that was over there to help cover was a 245 pound linebacker, and you saw how that went. But again, Asante Samuel didn't cost them the game. I just I wonder what the principles are there and what his job is, and if at any time he can kind of freestyle and say, "No, no, let me back, let me let me stay here because that's where they're going." You know, I think Harlan was asked something kind of along the lines of this, maybe at media day or maybe after the Boise game, just kind of, you know, is there a quarterback on the defense? Like, is there somebody who's call you know helps guys get lined up right? I guess maybe after the boys' game, we were talking about alignment and assignment and fit being off. Like, is there somebody there that can be like, hey, uh, Coop, shade over to your left a little bit more? And Harlan pretty much dismissed that, said that you know, no, you know, we call it in when we call in. You need to know your job, do your job, sort of a thing. So, yeah, I, I think they're trying to make things as simple as possible for these guys, so they don't want them having to really think. It's just, hey, uh, cover two, or you know, cover three, or you know, whatever. This is you're going to be your zone. Cover it. Do your job. And they they don't want other guys having to worry about what you know the other hand is doing. So you run into situations like that. And I don't know. Maybe the the better teams you start playing are going to realize these things and know that. You can do something as simple and subtle as that. It just you know, just start putting a guy in motion that's going to throw them uh, totally off whack, and they won't have an answer for it. So uh, that's where we're at on that. Uh, last thing I want to ask you about, Cord, before we uh, look at the big picture, I guess. Uh, the penalties, which was actually on the over-under from this past week, uh, Florida State personal foul penalties, one and a half. Uh, I took the over. You took the under. I was right, oh, which is, no. is starting oh, to be kind no. of uh, the, uh, the usual refrain with us. Um, what's, what's, is, is it going to ever end? Probably not. So the biggest problem I have with that is, um, Robert Cooper gets a personal foul, a big one too. Like they had finally, they had finally put them in second 12. They finally stopped the first down play because Virginia was dumb enough to run it. So instead of just taking a nine yard pass, so it's, it's going to be second 12 and I, you know, the, the play is over. I don't, you know, I don't know if he heard the whistle. I assume he heard the whistle, but even if he didn't, um, I assume he didn't hear the whistle. Um, but there's four guys with him. There's four other Florida State defenders with him. The play is obviously over. The running back has stopped running. Don't suplex him. Just don't do it. Why? Why? And the biggest problem is that he doesn't immediately come out of the game. So, you know, Willie can talk about wanting to punish these guys more and these stupid penalties and make them pay a price. But Marvin Wilson plays almost every snap after punching a guy in the face. And, hey, I'm with you. You don't want to take your best player off the field when it, in, the, in the most important drive. But Robert Cooper doesn't come out of the game after his personal foul. For Why? Why? Is he going to learn or is he not? Do you care enough to, to punish these guys or not? Because that's a, you, know, you can keep calling them selfish penalties, but then you keep letting them, in a way, get away with it. Because they keep doing it. So, no, it's not. 
you know, Robert Cooper shouldn't have played the rest of the game. Dontavious Jackson went right back in the game on that drive two weeks ago against Louisiana Monroe. So until you start p- taking something that really matters to them, which is playing time, away, they're going to keep doing it. Now, Marvin, as long as you don't hit three people in a game, you get to keep playing. Yeah, That's fine. You play really hard, and you're awesome. So try not to punch any more guys. But if you do, just hold it to one. Just keep it to one. But everybody else, literally everybody else on the defense, if you have a personal foul, you sit the rest of the quarter. Do so, what, I don't know what they do for punishment. I don't know if they run stadium steps or do sit-ups or have to FaceTime with their grandparents. I don't know what the punishment is, but it's not working. And um, it's, it's, you can't – at some point, it becomes a reflection of who's the who's the, it becomes a reflection of the coaching staff. It's they either these kids either care enough or they don't. I wonder how many personal fouls Alabama's gotten this season. I bet they haven't had four and a quarter. So yeah. it's just, in in look the Renardo Green play again. I know he's a freshman, and I know he's only in the game because and that's a bad break because Stanford Samuels hurt his hand or finger or something. Uh, maybe his shoulder. I wasn't sure. I, I don't think it was ever clear. I thought it was his hand. But you want to talk about the, the guy finally making a mistake. That ball is so poorly thrown, it's definitely going to be an interception, and it might be a pick six. But instead, you have your freshman DB flying with his helmet into another guy's helmet instead of even looking at the ball. But, uh, you know, And I can't say you have it. It's not like they teach him to do that. But when does it end? I guess I'm not even answering your question. I don't know. I don't know when it ends. Yeah. Florida State's never going to be Harvard when it comes to penalties. They're never going to be first in the nation and average two a game. But this stuff, that fourth quarter, again, it makes you wonder. Um, and I had uh, I had Shanna text me about it. My my ex-wife was just so irate at that at that stretch. Like these guys don't even deserve to win. They just completely melt down and. You know what? I, I can't argue with her. Like the, the, the Marvin Wilson punch in the end zone, what, what, I know I was joking about it, but what are you doing? It didn't matter. It literally didn't matter at all because they kicked off from the 50, and then they pooched anyway, and you got the 25. So it, it didn't hurt the team at all. But it's just, it's, you know, why are you doing that? And then you're right back out on the field. So are you going to punish them or not? Is it, is it going to be real punishment or not? I don't know what you can do. I don't know what you can do to, to curb it. Um, but it was, uh, I, I thought for the most part, they had played pretty well defensively, penalty wise. And then, uh, again, the fourth quarter happened, and all the same things from the last year and a half or two years uh, reared, their ugly, reared its ugly head. And you're left wondering, man, golly, these guys don't, not only do they not know how to win, they don't know how to win, they straight up excel in losing. They will figure out new and more exciting ways to lose a football game, it, like it's their job. And if it means getting four personal fouls in a quarter, then by, by God, we're going to get four personal fouls in a quarter. We're going to go head hunting instead of picking off a pass that could wrap up the game. So who knows, man? I'm not going to say it's culture. I don't know what the deal is. I know it needs to stop, and Willie needs to figure it out because he's not going to be around in 2023 if they keep uh, leading the nation of penalties. By the way, I should point out, you want to talk about a meltdown, Virginia's defense on that last drive was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't the whole drive? Didn't it, it was a. It was a. I think it was like a. Uh, what was it? Here we go. Seventy-two yard drive. It was. In sixty of no, the yards were penalties. Yeah, no gain on a rush from Blackman. Incomplete, sacked, incomplete, but pass interference, unsportsmanlike yeah, on tacked and on. Like Sixteen. Yeah, fourth and fifteen, unsportsmanlike tacked on top of it. Uh, Incomplete, Cam rushes for four, incomplete, fourth and five, McKitty drops it, personal foul, uh, completion, incomplete, sack timeout, and then, yeah, the, then the wheels come off or whatever. So, yeah, they, uh, they did so their, they had, their part. Yeah, they had 45 yards on their penalties. And, uh, and, the, and what's crazy is Minden in his mind over the correct call. Imagine Willie Taggart getting an unsportsmanlike penalty yeah. for a pass interference call that was actually the right call. The kid ran up his back, ran through him. He was there, uh, you know, uh, half a second too early. And Mendenhall is going to scream and lose his mind so much that he, he cost his team 15 yards. Imagine if that had happened to Taggart. But Virginia won, so nobody cares. But that, that, that team was trying to lose the game, and Florida State's just not quite good enough to take it from him. He's a nerd, by the way, Mendenhall. Like, in his postgame, you, you should have seen how emotional he was. Like, like he just beat – 
Bowden's 93 Florida State team or, or 2013 Florida State. It was it just, you know, this game, this moment, that team. Like, hey, he, easy, easy, Bronco. Slow down, buddy. You beat, you beat a team that's like 6-8 and eight in their last – yeah, they're 6-8 and eight in their last 14, oh. and I don't even know what they are in their last – 20 power five games, but I would guess nine and 11. Yeah, the only thing. Calm yourself. And Virginia students, go yeah, rush. Come on. You know, I hope you lose every game. <laughs> You're going to rush the field against Florida State. Uh, yeah, like you said, like they just stopped work done. Yeah. Cam Akers is an awesome player. He ain't on the 95 Florida State team. Yeah. Give me a break, man. Yeah, back Good to night. Back to the penalties, real quick. Um, just the only thing. I just don't know how much it is maybe to the to the point where this defense is just being told to play aggressive now. Like, just, just be a football player. Go out and make plays. I think, like, these generic sort of platitudes you probably are using at this point in time when you're struggling, just, just make a play. Go out and make a play. Play fast. Play physical. I think the whole four-on-four, four, null drill stuff at the beginning of practice plays into this where what they're doing really is never going to happen into a game, but it's just... It's trying to do controlled aggression to start off practice well, but it usually is just a bunch of chaos. You've got guys usually that end up blocking each other into the sidelines where their teammates are staying, and no one's getting flagged because there's no there's no referees monitoring that drill. I, I just think this whole – I think it's just the, the drumming up thing of let's make these guys think they're tough so they play tough. It, end up, it ends up manifesting itself in these situations at the worst times, it seems. The one I will defend sort of – Cooper's penalty a little bit just because that fourth and two where it looked like they had Perkins stopped and stuffed them uh, you know this happens everywhere and this isn't me being a homer this happens everywhere and they need to figure out a way to stop it where these games just devolve into rugby scrums where defenses make stops but the offense gets a fourth or fifth opportunity to to, to push the pile forward and then the forward progress they say hasn't stopped like that that's crazy like they had them stopped on fourth and two and then three seconds later, he kind of squirts free, and they're like, all right, move the chains. So I can see Cooper the next time around where he's holding a guy up that he's going to make the guy go down so that there's no sort of gray area left in there. So I don't know. That's a Yeah, thing. I mean, I, I get that. that. That was a huge play, by the way, the fourth and two. They yeah. just didn't uh, – They and I don't even think that was really the, as much a rugby scrum as this Perkins just kind of muscling his way forward. But, yeah, I, you know, I, I hate that. I hate the whole – the, 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 he's wrapped up, and then the lineman comes and slams into the pile and starts moving at three yards. I mean, that doesn't seem fair. What's the defense supposed to do other than jerk them down as hard as they can? And then you get a penalty. But in that instance, it was first down. Um, that kid was not breaking the grasp of Robert Cooper. He was he was square in the grasp of a 340-pound dude with huge arms. That kid had stopped. And yeah. you got to know that. He can feel that. He doesn't need... To, to throw him down quite he just doesn't need to throw him down like that I don't I, I get what you're saying uh, but in that instance you, you just got to know better you just got to know better but it's a lot of plays where you, you'd say you just got to know better big picture thoughts but first at Birch Orthodontics they know what a difference a beautiful and healthy smile can make in your life they take the time to get to know you and perform a thorough exam so that they can make an individualized treatment plan just for you or your child they use the latest technology in a warm and comfortable environment so whether you are interested in traditional metal or clear braces or clear aligners they can give you the smile you deserve they know investing in your smile means investing in your future and at Birch Orthodontics they are honored to be a part of your smile journey serving Tallahassee for 16 years and supporting the Knowles since forever Check them out at birchorthodontics.com. B-U-R-C-H orthodontics.com. Welcome back to Wake Up Board Champ presented by Zaxby's. I'm Aslan. He's Corey Clark. Uh, thanks for being here. Corey, just two sort of big picture things we wanted to talk about, and I, I don't know how long it's going to take to talk about it, but um, you know, I just thought it was worth talking about. We, we you know, discussed what happened in the game, obviously, that led to another loss, Florida State dropping to 1-2 and two on the season. Uh, drops their ACC opener. Louisville comes to town 3.30 on Saturday. Ultimately, crazy enough, and I tweeted out as soon as, as soon as the game was over, they lost the game, obviously. I still think, I think it was the best 60 minutes the Florida State team has played under Willie Taggart. I mean, do you agree or disagree with that? Uh, it's close. I, I, I just, the fourth quarter leaves such a bad taste. Uh, not just because of how the game ended on the final play, uh, just confu- mass confusion it looked like, um, and not just because of the personal fouls. It was just the defense had no chance of stopping them. But was there ever a thought 
uh, on those last two drives of the fourth quarter. That I don't even know if they got to a third down. I mean, there was just no chance, no none. They didn't, they didn't bow up or whatever cliche you want to use. And so that leaves you with a little bit of a bitter taste in your mouth that, man, one time can somebody make a play? Can somebody make a play? Or maybe more accurately, will the coaches put them in a position to make a play? Are they going to tell them to play 14 yards off the ball and let everybody catch the ball at, you know, for a seven-yard completion and then rally up and try to make force a fumble? I don't, I don't know. I have no idea what was going on uh, in the fourth quarter with that defense other than maybe they were just exhausted and there was nothing. They, it would have mattered anyway. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, it reminded me a bit of the Miami game. Um, it, it, they played well. They believed. And we saw how last season ended after the Miami game. So that's where when we look at macro and, and what this team can be and what this season can be and big more big picture what this Willie Taggart tenure is going to be, it's going to come down, man, I think, to these two weeks. I really do. I've, I've pegged these two weeks coming up. You got Louisville at home that's, you know, certainly improved, but also definitely beatable. And you got NC State at home that just gave up, you know, 45 or whatever points to West Virginia, and it's not a normal West Virginia team. It's a pretty bad one. Yep. So these are two eminently winnable games before Clemson. And if you come out lethargic, if you come out and, you know, fiddle fart around and you're in a game in the fourth quarter, I'm expecting you're going to lose. I, you know, I, I don't think I'm alone because – you know, I, I just am. I, you know, you, you made some plays against Louise and Monroe. You had one nice drive against Virginia in the fourth quarter after they answered it. But other than that, other you know, you, you didn't do anything except hope that Virginia committed penalties. And so how are they going to respond to this loss? Was this their one last shot? And um, you, you, they say to themselves, man, we gave it everything we had. We played as hard as we possibly could, and we still didn't win. So what's the point? Does that happen? I think there's some of that still left in that locker room. Nobody's proven otherwise yet. So how did they rebound from a tough loss? Because they did not rebound well from their tough loss in game one. So how can, and they didn't rebound really, maybe they beat somebody after the Miami game last year, but then they went into a tailspin and lost five of their last six. So, and all by blowouts. So how are they going to respond? Can they respond from a tough loss? I mean, I thought it was a good sign that they didn't get blown out. That was a good sign for that they believed in the coaches this week and they rallied up and they played hard. They played with some pride. But at the end of the day, they still lost and they still melted down in the fourth quarter. And now they're, they're going to be wondering. Literally, they're going to be wondering, what, what do we got to do? And, yeah, Corey, I, mean, I do agree with you that obviously that this is – this is better than getting blown out. Um, it's still a loss, but it's, you know, it's, it's degrees of getting better, which I think we can all, all can kind of see and agree on. But, you know, the cynic in me does wonder if this was almost like the worst case. I think the Boise loss in, in so many ways was like a worst case for this team because they did look so dominant in the first half. And then things just, you know, went awry for them in the second half. And then I think Virginia with all the, all the doubt swirling around the team, whether that's internal in the locker room or whether it's from the fans, the media, whatever you want, whoever you want to blame, you got a starting wide receiver in DJ Matthews who didn't travel with the team, was suspended. Um, you know, you brought in this new sort of uh, fixer, if you will, and Jim Levitt to help out the defense. Um, you're playing on the road, ranked team. No one's giving you a chance. And, and, and the fact that you were able to play so well, you have a halftime lead once again, and then it doesn't work out. I almost wonder if that's kind of if this was worse than than losing thirty five to three, like in Boston College or something like that. Because you did have the hope, you did play so hard, and it still doesn't pay off for you. But I guess in these next two weeks, to your point, we'll we'll sort of see just you know how impactful the loss was. You know, the last thing I want to mention, Corey, is I, I things do look better, and I think if this thing is ultimately going to work, it's going to work with with. Willie Taggart being the CEO. Florida State's going to have to take a page out of the Oregon playbook, uh, other than the fact that they're paying the head coach full freight. You know, Oregon paid Willie only $3 million and then had money to invest in Mario Cristobal as the offensive coordinator and Jim Levitt as the defensive coordinator. I, I think that's what's going to, that's why I, I spoke the way I did last week when Levitt got hired. I just think that them doing that hire, Jim Levitt didn't come back to hang out for 10 weeks to help out Harlan Barnett. I think he came here with some sort of, uh, notion that he, 
you know, Willie's going to get another year and he's going to be able to be defensive coordinator and they'll show the improvements and then he's going to get another year on top of that. So with all that said, you know, they did get better. You're going to have good coordinators. You'll have Willie as your, your sort of CEO. Um, and they played so hard, man. And, and let's be honest, half the guy, I mean, the, the starting 22, how many of the starting 22 are guys that were recruited by Willie Taggart? It's, so it kind of is crazy to see how hard they did play with all this uncertainty for a coach that didn't recruit them. That has to bode well, I guess, for this this identity or this this roadmap of Willie being your CEO. I mean, maybe you know you'd hope it doesn't you, you don't it doesn't matter who recruited you. You should play hard to play hard because your teammates are there, guys you've lived with for two or three years. You'd hope you'd play hard. It is a it is a positive sign though that they didn't quit, and I think a lot of us, me included. I thought they were going to get blown out. Yeah. Um, I did not bet the game because I don't bet. But if I was going to, I would have lost a lot of money. I guess I would have pushed. Um, so I'd have lost just a little bit of money. But I would have thought I thought they were going to get rolled. I thought they'd go up there and it'd be like the NC State game last year. They put up some points, but their defense just wouldn't would do anything. So they did answer the challenge a little bit, which was good. But now there's a whole other challenge. There's a challenge of okay, we weirdly, we feel kind of good about ourselves again. If that's the 25th best team in the country, and I think Boise's ranked or close to being ranked, well, heck, we've lost um, to two ranked teams by by one score each as opposed to last year when we got annihilated by everyone. We're pretty darn, we might be pretty darn good. If we if we cut up, uh, if we cut out all the dumb mistakes and the penalties, we might be able to be uh, have a pretty good season. You know, there is a chance again that they just say, man, what was the point? We played really hard and for what? Or there's another chance where they, there's another part of me that thinks they might think they're better than they are, weirdly. Because, I, again, this roster, this team, it's, such a, it's in such a uh, – um, it's, it's just a mystery, man. It's so hard to read how good they really think they are, um, how good they are, period. Uh, their mindset, it's really – it seems to go from week to week. And I, I just don't know. I can't, I, can't fa- I, I can't fathom a guess on how they're going to play the next two weeks. They could lose to Louisville by three touchdowns. I genuinely genuinely believe that. I also think they can beat Louisville by three touchdowns. I have no idea how they're going to play these next two weeks. None. Because I, they've, never, they've never been consistent in how they handle losses and adversity. Sometimes they rally up and seem to play pretty hard. And I'm going back to 2017, too. And sometimes they just completely lay an egg. So I, I, I genuinely don't know what they're going to do. I, I was... Uh, I was you know, pleasantly surprised with how well and hard they played um, up front on both lines of scrimmage, especially the defensive line of scrimmage, in the run game, how they completely took away Virginia's running game from the running backs. That was something they hadn't done at all. So that's something to build on. But will they be able to do it two weeks in a row? I don't know. Don't know. Don't know, guys. I ain't a soothsayer. I know I call myself the Coracle, but I don't know. This team is – I've lost all my powers with this team. I mean, I believe they will. I mean, I think they can build off of this. I I would be surprised if they if they took steps back on defense. I mean, the offense. I don't know, uh, you know, how much more they can grow, or if this is just they're going to be wildly inconsistent the way they are. Um, but I mean, I was encouraged by the way the defense played. And I think if the deep defense can can you know put another foot or two in front of the other, and the offense just you know works out a kink or two here and there. Yeah, I mean, bull eligibility is back on the table. Which I know is a bizarre sort of bar to Yee-hoo! set, but you know that, we did it. We did it. Well, well I mean, abilities back on the table, baby. I I, I just think we're here. I, I just don't. I thought that if they don't go to a bowl game for two years in a row, he's gone. But I again, I think the Levitt hire says that no. It's just it. This is it's 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 going to be too expensive to start over again. There's no sure things. So let's just do what seems to be the prudent move here and is bring in a guy that can help get the defense maybe back on track this year. And if not, in 2020, uh, they'll look much better or better. And then in 2021, it's you give them one final kind of crack at things and you'll really know what you have at that point. Now, well, there's not, look, there's nine games left. Uh, you know, they, they could go two and seven, one and eight. They could also go seven and two. I, man, look at what those teams on the schedule. Like, I think Wake Forest is good. That's a tough game, but yes. they're not nearly as dominant as they look for a half against North Carolina. Boston College. Um, Trash. You know, you know there's, there's, there, there are all these games they can go and win. They're not – Florida just lost their starting quarterback. Um, so there's only one surefire loss the rest of the schedule. 
And I do think if they play that, I mean, that was their, that the, they played their three toughest, their four toughest games on the schedule were coming into the season, in my opinion, were Boise, at Virginia, at Clemson, and at Florida. Well, they're through two of them. And if you want to point back to last year and how they got embarrassed at Syracuse in game three, their first road game, they have made market improvements. Yep. They have. They, they played hard. They had a close game. It came down to the, literally the final play. I, it's a weird place to be. We're, we're talking about Florida State. You, there are no moral victories. Um, but in a way, that kind of felt like it a little bit. If it, wasn't, if, if it hadn't ended with the nonsense on the final play, and if it hadn't ended with the personal fouls and the defense just collapsed in the fourth quarter, I, I felt like that would have been a moral victory for most Florida State fans, which is where we are right now. It's just the reality. It's dumb. I know we can roll our eyes and think, how did we get here? But that's where we are. We're here. So they are better than they were last year. They're a better team than they are were last year. But I also we have no idea how the next nine weeks are going to go. They can implode or they can rally. They could end up 8-4. and four. It really could happen. Four to eight's also on the table. So it's three and nine. Like, nobody knows how this thing's going to play out. But, yeah, I think the, the last play – uh, really kind of took the morality out of that moral victory. And also, I, I mean, they did look better. Uh, they were more motivated. They did they did play harder. Um, you know, and, and there's going to be learning on the job sort of thing here. You know, Willie is going to have to kind of grow into the CEO role, I think. I mean, that's that's the roadmap forward for Florida State, I feel like. They're going to try to go with the, the Dabo route. The concern for me is that, you know, Willie's been a head coach for 10 years. With Dabo, you can kind of understand trying to find your sea legs the, the first few years. Like, Willie has been a head football coach. You shouldn't be struggling in certain aspects of, of the game that he continues to do so, but maybe he's learned to be the CEO. The one thing that, that concerns me, though, is you got to learn how to, to, to manage, obviously, you, and, and that means in-game, the, the timeout against Louisiana Monroe was a, was a really bizarre, wacky sort of situation. The way they handled the last snap against Virginia was up there. Um, the, you know, I know people think it's making a mountain out of a molehill, but just what you said during the Deckerhoff, you know, your, your call-in show, and then you hold this press conference and make a kind of cringy uh, statement to the world that, you know, hydration wasn't a big deal. And, and then the way he answered this question, I'm going to play right here, Corey, um, the way he answered a question just kind of about the protocol of calling in a play to me seemed a little bit odd. Was that a situation where you already had the play called up before you converted the third down? Did you already know what you were going to run if you converted it? Well, I didn't call the plays. Kim knew called the plays, but uh, he had the play called. And again, we just didn't get it done. I, I, we know. We know Kendall calls the plays. He's getting $1.1 million a season to call plays and to resuscitate this offense. That was a bizarre answer. I, 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 that didn't seem to me to be a, a critical question coming from Tashawn Reed of The Athletic. That seemed to be kind of, hey, uh, just want to know what was going into the, into the thought process on that last play. Because, they, again, they had, the, they had the incompletion, and then they had the sack, and then – you get the conversion with, with, with Keyshawn. So, like, was there was this sort of uh, a situation where it was like, hey, if we, we, if we don't get the third down, this is what we're on fourth down. If we get the third down, this is what we're going to do. Simple question, but to, to say that about your core, that to me just, like, a CEO doesn't do that. I don't think Saban says, well, I, I don't call the offensive plays. You can, call the, you, can, you can talk to Sark about that. You know, and I don't want to compare him to Saban. That, that to me, I don't know how much of this is, this team has to learn how to win, maybe – also, Willie needs to learn a little bit how to really truly be a CEO because he hasn't had to fill that role at a place like Western Kentucky and South Florida and Oregon for one. It year. was uh, yeah when I when I saw that press the the press conference clip or I read watched the press conference in, in its entirety, that seemed like a really weird distinction to make to a question like that. The answer that to, you know that Tashawn and everybody under the sun was wanting to know is what happened on the final play. Is that something you guys practice to? Uh, you know, was that something you had called, hey, if we get down inside the five, we have this play ready to go? And the head coach should answer it with either, yeah, that's something we work on or that's something that they work on, whatever he wants to say. However he wants to, uh, you know, to talk about it is fine. But it was just an odd distinction in that moment to say, first off, Kendall, Brow, you know, uh, Kendall calls the plays. Yeah, like you said, yeah, we know, man, we know. Nobody's blaming you for for saying you know Kendall had a fade to Terry, and then you're like no no let's give him the warrant done. Nobody nobody thinks you were doing that, but uh, it was just odd. It was you know and the problem with it is that I don't think 
Willie Taggart meant anything by it. I don't, I don't think he was saying, hey, man, this was Kendall's fault, not mine. I'm, I'm throwing my hands up. Uh, Willie, Willie takes ownership of these losses in this program. But, you know, we're talking – people can read between the lines on that. Even if there are no lines to be read between – even if the, let me put this. Even if there's nothing to read there, he still separated some lines and made people think maybe there is something to read there. Like maybe Willie's really upset at his coordinator for not calling a timeout or not spiking the ball. And so that, and if, if that's the case, I understand because it was crazy. Spike the ball. But also, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's how you, you handle a question like that. But, again, I also think he was asked a direct question about you. I think they said you, you called the play or whatever. The, whatever however, Deshaun phrased it. Maybe Willie took it as, you know, you, Willie Taggart, called that play. Did you call two plays back-to-back? And Willie, not thinking of, like, the royal we, um, just said, well, no, I didn't call any of them. It's Kendall that called it. When, when obviously, we know, but we also know the head coaches and coordinators talk. And what was the plan? We don't get to talk to Kendall till Wednesday or Tuesday. What, what was the plan there? What, the, what was the thinking there? Not, hey, Willie, why, why did you call that play? What did Kendall want to run? Nobody – that wasn't any. There was no. There was none of that in the question. There was no uh, veiled, uh, veiled snipes. I don't think it was just a legitimate. What what happened there? What was the idea there? And again, not a big deal. Just like the hydration thing, really wasn't a big deal. But it also seems like sometimes you gotta. I don't even know. It just it was a weird distinction. It was odd. It was just odd. I don't. I don't. It was an odd distinction. It read to me a little bit like. Um, wasn't my idea that, that he was upset. That, yeah, it wasn't my idea that yeah. I, I would have spiked the ball, and I guess you wouldn't want to say that. But uh, you could say, yeah, I think in hindsight we probably should spike it instead of saying I don't call. You know, I don't call the plays. Kendall calls the play. Yeah, man, we know. You know, Harlan calls the defensive plays. We got that. We all we all understand the um, the, the pyramid here and and what the coach's duties are. But you know that was a. Uh, just an odd, odd, uh, odd way to phrase that. But again, it's not, it's not a big deal, and, it, and I don't think that cost him the game. You know, it, it didn't. The defense in the fourth quarter cost him the game. Right. My point, I guess, just being yeah, to this, I, I the, mean, the agree, CEO role is just man, that it's a, the concern is that it, we're not even out of the month of September, and this, like, people need to come over the top of Willie to clarify comments that he's made. So, like, if, if we're yeah, going to be the, the C- second for the second time, yeah. So, if we're going to be the CEO, uh, a well-paid CEO with all the tools at our disposal to win football games in the uh, in the form of seven-figure uh, coordinators and stuff, then we need to make sure that you know we're we're putting on a strong message as the the front-facing member of this organization, this program. Uh, and again, I mean, there's things that maybe hopefully he can learn, and th- this is a new sort of. Uh, terrain for him to navigate, and it and is for Florida State fans too. As I said, that you know, bowl territory or bowl uh, eligibility is back on the table, and you need to be excited about that. So we're all learning and stuff we, together, everybody. We are, man, and, and I, you know, maybe the maybe the season is turning around. Maybe that was the last loss they'll have, and everything's going to be rainbows and puppy dogs from here. Um, and Clemson doesn't have a chance. They do, but uh, but you know what 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 is concerning if you're a Florida State fan, I think, is that you had a week. Was it a week or two weeks that uh, Levante Taylor wasn't available? A week. Um, yeah, and then obviously the stuff with Logan Tyler. By the way, Logan Tyler, I'm sorry, man, you're done. You got Wally Pip. I don't know what <laughs> yeah. I don't know what your deal is anyway. Yeah, if you were ever going to come back, but Tommy Martin, <laughs> yeah, dude. boom, some punch. Yeah, man. Uh, and that kickoff kid is unreal. Grote House, yeah. Holy moly, those, he's kicking those things through the upright. So Logan, sorry, bud. Um, and then and then what happened with DJ? A, a guy you were counting on, a guy that was like, what, wasn't he the MVP of the spring? Yeah, most um, improved or something yeah. like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, and then what's he doing that he can't play? It's it's, it's not great. You, you have some concerns here about, and the concern I've written about and I've talked about on this show is, do the players really believe in what's going on right now? How much faith, it doesn't matter how much faith we have, how much faith do the players have in this program right now, in this coaching staff. And there's just little blips here and there, like a you know, starting receiver getting suspended indefinitely. Um, Levante Taylor, a senior, coming back for a senior year and then getting uh, you know, not suspended but not playing. Um, so whatever, how, whatever distinction you want to make there. Logan Tyler, like, are they buying in or not? Did they care about this thing or not? Because you, you hope that this stuff is ending. 
And the guys that are here that have been here now with this coaching staff for coming on two years had, would buy in more and it would mean more than to miss games. Now, that said, Kelvin Smith was suspended a couple of times when he was at Florida State. I would never, I would never accuse him of not caring about Florida State. So things happen. It's not all Willie Taggart's fault. But you just hope the players are buying into this message, man, because if they're not, um, it, you know, it could be trouble. It could be more trouble. I think they are, though. I mean, I think the way they played against Virginia shows that they have, and I, I can't imagine that many more obstacles that they'll face that they're, they'll have opportunities to fold, even if they lose to Louisville or anything like that. I, again, I just think I think he's firmly entrenched, man. I, I really do. So it's kind of uh, either embrace this new, uh, this new reality or uh, kick and scream and shake your fist against the cloud. Um, I think he's here to stay, man. That's where we're at. Hey, let's do the over-unders real quick, Corey. Um, I went five and one. You went four and two. Cam's touches thirty-two. We both said under. We were right. Florida State personal fouls one and a half. You said under. I said over. I got that one on you. I'm always going over on that for okay. the rest of the season. James Blackman, uh, two hundred fifty yards passing. We both said over. We were wrong. He went under two thirty-four. If he hits Tamori and Terry, yeah. Yeah. We both win. Yeah, we do. And a bunch of people would have gone six for six. We had a whole bunch of people go five of six, and that was the one they all Ooh, got wrong. Right. Uh, time of possession for Florida State, 25 and a half minutes. We both took the under because we're intelligent. Also, to your point earlier in the show, Corey, Florida State is 130th out of 130 teams with 23 minutes and 10 seconds of average time of possession in the football games they've played thus far. Uh, Virginia third down conversion, 55%. We both took the under. We were correct. That's because Virginia converted on only five of their 12 third downs. Uh, official points scored, 58. We both took the over. We were correct. And I was nice enough to not even hold the Jim Levitt one against no, we you. Weren't. What? What are you talking about? Did you say we both were correct with the over? Oh. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. We both got it wrong then. I apologize. We both got it wrong. What's the matter with you? Up. Come on. That's that, that's that Florida public education math. Uh, right I was, that was, I was, you know, had all these parlays going. So you're three and three. I went four and two. Right. Um, oh, it's still not great. And, I, and the, Levitt, the Levitt one that we did with two and a half shots of him on the broadcast, you said over, I said under, but we're not even going to use that one because I'm going to help you, you know, get back into the game. They, I don't even think they mentioned Thank him. Thank you very much. They even mentioned him on the broadcast. Crazy. Yeah, that was crazy. Not at all, especially with how well they were playing the first three quarters. Yeah. You thought that'd be all they were talking about. It's crazy. It's crazy. Hey, let's go talk to Willie, and then let's talk to everybody else again on the Tuesday edition of Wake Up War Chant. What do you say, Corey? I can't wait to do it, buddy. I love you more than you'll ever know. Oh, gosh. How can I not be successful after hearing that? Have a great day, everybody. We'll talk to you later. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. Warchant.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source.